Today we're going to talk about section 1.5, which is on linear equations, functions, zeros, and applications. So a big part of this section is on word problems. And here at North Lake College, all of the college algebra classes follow the following technique for uh, grading word problems, essentially. So you're going to be graded on the following criterion. So the, the sort of acronym here is DESS, D-E-S-S. Each one of the letters here stands for a step on which you'll be graded on uh, an exam or a quiz. So the D here stands for defining your variables. There's two things that I look for when I grade a word problem in the define your variables step. The first is that your variables should always stand for a number. So for instance, uh, Timmy is not a number. However, Timmy's age is a number. So your variable should always stand for, it should always represent a number. Second, you need specificity. The, uh, oftentimes in a word problem, there will be, say for instance, more than one time running around in the problem. So if you say t equals time, it's not specific enough. So I'm looking for two things, number and specificity. And I'll always be looking for these things in the define step. Generally speaking, the way that you want to define your variable in a word problem is to name it after whatever it is that you're looking for. So if you're looking for Timmy's age, you should call A or X Timmy's age. So the key words to sort of look for here are usually find or determine. Sometimes neither of those will be present, but uh, you'll see a question mark. And usually that's a pretty good indica indication that that's how you want to name your variable. The second step is to write down an equation uh, relating your variable to things that you know. So uh, here you're going to use the variable that you defined in the D step above. Now, uh, this step will vary from problem to problem. It depends on the problem how your equation is going to look, but we'll see a few examples of this in just a minute. The third, the third step is to solve that equation. This is where the algebra comes in. It's just turning the crank, getting a solution out for whatever variable it is that you named. And finally, the second S here is to state your answer. And for this, you're going to need a complete sentence, capitalization, period, subject, verb, the works here. So make sure you're answering the question that's being asked. Just to give you an example, uh, sometimes you'll be asked for the dimensions of a garden. And if you give the area of the garden, maybe your area is correct, but you're answering the incorrect question, so to speak. You're giving the right answer to the wrong question. So uh, this step is to make sure that you look back at the statement of the question and make sure that you're answering what's being asked here. So we're going to see this demonstrated uh, in the first example. And for this example, we're going to go to the book here. So this is going to be on page 134, exercise number 33, which is on income taxes. So we're looking at this problem here. In 2008, 36.3% of all tax filers paid no income taxes. This percentage is 10.7% more than the percentage of filers in 1990 who paid no income taxes. We want to find the percentage of tax filers in 1999 who paid no income taxes. So to solve this problem, we'll go over to the whiteboard app. So in this exercise, because we're working with a word problem, we need to follow that D-E-S-S -S technique. That's what you're going to be graded on. So you'll notice in the last sentence in the statement of the problem, it says find. That's the key word that we're looking for here. Find the percentage of tax filers in 1999 who paid no income taxes. So in this case, our first step is going to be to define our variable. That's the D step. It doesn't really matter what letter you use for your variable, but it's very frequent to use X. And that's what we're going to use here. In this particular case, we're going to let X stand for the number of, ta uh, sorry, the percentage of tax filers in 1999 paying no income tax. So you'll notice two things about this definition. First, X stands for a number. It's the percentage of tax filers, and that percentage is itself a number. Second, it's specific. There are two different years running around in this problem. One is 1999 and one is 2008. If I just called X the percentage of tax filers, it's not specific enough. I need to separate 1999 from 2008. So I'll be looking for number and specificity in your definitions. The second step is to write down an equation that relates the variables based on the information that you're given in the problem. Now in this particular problem, we're told that in 2008, 36.3% of all tax filers paid no income taxes at all. 
and that that number is 10.7% more than the percentage of tax filers in 1999 who paid no income taxes, which we've called X. The equation in this particular case is X plus 0.107X equals 0.363. This first X here is the percentage in 1999 who paid no income taxes. This second term on the, the I'm sorry, uh, the term on the right-hand side, that 0.363, is the percentage of um, tax filers in 2008 paying no income taxes. And the second term on the left-hand side here is the additional 10.7% of the percentage in 1999 not paying any income taxes. Two things to note about this equation. First, all of our percentages have been converted into decimals. Second, of the percentage in 1999, you'll notice that I underlined of here, of corresponds to a, an, uh, an arithmetic operation, namely multiplication. So when you say 10.7% of something, you mean multiplication. 10.7% of the percentage in 1999 is 0.107x. The additional part is what gives us the addition here. So this is a fairly straightforward equation to solve. In the first S step, we do exactly that. So first, we're going to combine the like terms on the left-hand side, and we end up with 1.107x equals 0.363. We then divide both sides by 1.107. And that's going to give us x equals 0.3279. Now, before you go boxing up your answer here, remember that the last step is to state your solution in the complete sentence, being sure to answer the question that's being asked. In this particular case, our statement step goes as follows. The percentage of tax filers who paid no tax in 1999 was 32.79%. Next up, we're going to talk about the simple interest formula. So the idea behind simple interest is uh, you take out a loan, say, uh, $100, for instance. And this loan comes with 5% uh, interest in simple interest. So what this means is when the loan comes due, you pay that entire $100 back plus an additional 5% of that principal uh, sort of as a, as a uh, favor for borrowing that money, so to speak. In this case, interest is only charged once when you pay the interest back. We're going to contrast that with something called compound interest, which we'll see a little later in the, the semester. So the simple interest formula reads as follows. I equals P times R times T. So here, this P is the principal amount that you borrow. So the P is for principal. That is the initial amount of money that you borrow or lend. R is the interest rate here, which is always assumed to be written as a decimal. So 5%, for instance, would be written 0.05. T is the amount of time that's passed in years. Uh, universally in this class and pretty much every other one that you take, interest rates are always uh, uh, annual interest rates. It's very rare to see interest rates other than that. And then finally, I here is the amount of interest that you owe total. So. What we're going to do now is take a look at an example with uh, simple interest. The next example that we're going to work through is example 8, which shows up on page 128 in your book. So in this case, Jared's two student loans total $12,000. One loan is at 5% simple interest, and the other is at 8% simple interest. After one year, Jared owes $750 in interest. What's the amount of each loan? So we'll head over to the whiteboard app to see a solution of this example. In this example, what we're looking for is the amount of each loan that Jared has taken out. So our first step, as always, is going to be, able, is going to, be to define a variable. Now, in this particular case, I only want to define one variable. You'll notice that the question states, what is the amount of each loan? But I'm only going to work with my variable x in this case. And in this particular case, I'm going to let X stand for the amount borrowed at 8%. Now, I'm working an example that's already been worked in the book on page 128. And you should go through the solution in the book as well, because they let X stand for the amount borrowed at 5%. You'll see that our work will look very different, but the answer that we get is exactly the same. So in this case, X is the amount borrowed at 8%. Once again, we're always looking for number and specificity. In this naming, 
the number that I'm talking about is the amount, the number of dollars that I'm uh, borrowing at 8%. You'll notice you can't say X, for instance, equals the 8% loan. An 8% loan is not a number. The amount borrowed at 8%, however, is. Also, specificity, and that's the 8% here. There's two loans running around in this problem. You have to distinguish between the two. So that 8% loan is the specificity part of this. Now we want to write down our equation. First thing that we know from the statement of the problem is that Jared owes $750 in interest. So this $750 is the total amount of interest owed. And that interest is spread between the 8% loan and the 5% loan. So on the right hand side, the interest from the 8% loan we get from the simple interest formula, which is 0 0.08 times x times one. Here the 0 0.08 is the interest rate, x is the amount borrowed at 8%, and one is the amount of time that's passed, which we're told in this problem is one year. Next up, we need the amount of interest from the 5% loan, but things get a little more complicated here. So the simple interest formula once again says the interest rate, which is 0.05, multiplied by the entire amount borrowed at 5% times 1, which is the amount of time that's passed, is the amount of interest owed at 5%. Now, what I've written in green here is the total amount that Jared has borrowed at 5% interest. This is 12000 the total, minus the total amount that he borrowed at 8%. Now you'll notice here that I could have called what's in green a brand new variable, say y. But then I have two variables running around and it complicates the solving step which comes next. So whenever possible you want to use only one variable. Uh, this second term that comes after the addition is the interest from the 5% loan total. So our solve step, the first thing that we're going to do on the right hand side is distribute the 0 0.05 into those green parentheses. And what we get after we do that is 0.08x plus 600 minus 0.05x. We're going to combine like terms on the right hand side and then subtract 600 from both sides. And what we end up with is 150 equals 0.03x. Next up, we're going to divide both sides by 0 0.03, and that gives us that x is 5,000. Now notice, by the way that we named our variables, x is the amount we borrowed at 8%, which tells us that the remainder of that $12,000, namely $7,000, was borrowed at 5%. Just like always, we state our answer as a complete sentence, answering the question that's being asked. Notice the, the, the that the question is asking for the amount of each loan. We don't just want the amount borrowed at 8%. So the answer to our question is the amount borrowed at 8% is $5,000 and the amount borrowed at 5% is $7,000. Next up we're going to work our way through example 10 in the book which is on page 130. In this example, a metro taxi charges $1.25 pickup fee and $2 per mile traveled. Cecilia's cab fare from the airport to her ho hotel is $31.25. How many miles did she travel in the cab? So let's head over to the whiteboard app and we'll work through this example. You'll notice that in the statement of this problem, the question asks how many miles did she travel in the cab followed by a question mark. That question mark is usually an indication that you're going to name your variable after something in that sentence. So we start off going through this word problem using our define step. And in this case, I'm going to call my variable x and uh, x is going to stand for the number of miles in the cab since that's what I'm trying to find. Remember, when I'm grading these things, I'm always going to be looking for uh, the following two criteria. First, does your variable stand for a number? In this case, yes, this is the number of miles uh, that, that's traveled in the cab. Second of all, is your definition specific enough? In this case, there's only one distance running around. That is the number of miles that she travels in the cab. So our specificity condition is met here as well. Our next step is to write down an equation. In this case, the equation is 1.25 plus 2x equals 31.25. In this particular case, this 1.25 is the pickup fee, and it's fixed. It doesn't vary with the number of miles that Cecilia travels. The 2 here that you see in the second term is the price per mile, and x, as we named it above, is the number of miles traveled. 
When you multiply the price per mile times the number of miles traveled, you get the total cost uh, that sort of varies depending on the number of mile that Cecilia pays for this particular trip. On the other side of the equation is 31.25. That's the total fare that Cecilia spent on this trip. Next up, we're going to solve for x. First step, we take our equation and subtract 1.25 from both sides. This gives us 2x equals 30. We then divide both sides by 2, which is going to leave x equals 15. That concludes the solve step. Next up, we have to state our answer in a complete sentence addressing the question that's being asked, using appropriate units when necessary. In this case, our statement step says that Cecilia traveled 15 miles, and really that's specific enough. It's a complete sentence. Um, if you really wanted, you could say Cecilia traveled 15 miles in a cab, but the truth is this would get you full points in this particular problem. Next up, we're going to see a new definition, and that's the definition of a zero of a function. So zero of a function f of x is a number c such that f of c is zero. Notice in this case that a zero is an x value. More specifically, it's an x value at which y is 0. So the wording can be a little bit confusing here, but just remember that a 0 is an x value at which y is 0. The following three things are equivalent when it comes to this new word. So first, c is a 0 of f of x. That's equivalent to the point c, 0 being an x-intercept of the graph of f of x. And finally, third, c is a solution to the equation f of x equals 0. What this third equivalence means is that when you want to find a 0 of a function, you set y equal to 0 and solve for x. That'll give you the zeros of the function, which we're going to see in the next example. In this example, we're asked to find the 0 or zeros of the function f of x equals 5x plus 7. So the solution goes as follows here. Remember that a 0 is an x value at which y equals 0. And by that third equivalence on the last slide, what that means is we need to set y equal to 0 and solve for x. So the equation that we're looking to solve here is at, uh, sorry, 5x plus 7, that's f of x, equals 0, where 0 here is the y value. So this, this equation is straightforward to solve. We'll go through this real fast. First, we subtract 7 from both sides. That gives us 5x equals minus 7. Next up, we divide both sides by 5, which gives us x equals minus 7 fifths. What this means is 7, uh, sorry, minus 7 fifths is the only zero of this function f of x. That's our answer. That concludes the lecture for section 1.5. I'll see you guys back here for 1.6.